the next talk is uh, from our Sheikh Saab Hassan Abdel Ghaffar. Like I mentioned, Sheikh Ziyad Hiyadi Jaza from uh, Sheikh Abdel Ghaffar Hassan, the father of Sheikh Suhaib. I mean, Sheikh Suhaib's great grandfather, Sheikh Abdel Jabbar Umar Puri, like Sheikh um, uh, Hamad uh, Lakhvi and uh, Sheikh uh, Adnan Rashid, he was as well uh, as ancestor, he was as well a student of Mianda Zuri St. Delhi, and he was a great scholar and muhaddis. Uh, likewise, Sheikh uh, Suhaib Hassan's grandfather, Sheikh Abdel Sattar Hassan, but he passed away young, but he was a great scholar. And his father, Sheikh Abdul Ghaffar Hassan, he graduated from Darul Hadis Rahmani and Delhi, and he be benefited from the great scholars uh, Nazir Ahmad Rahmani and Ubaidullah Mubarak Puri, the author of uh, Miratul Mafati. And Sheikh Abdul Ghaffar Hassan taught for many years in Medina University after Sheikh Albani left. So he was a scholar who was recommended to be uh, by Sheikh Ismail Salafi when Sheikh Ibn Baz asked him from some scholars of Hadith. Sheikh Ismail Salafi recommended Hafiz Muhammad Gondilvi and Sheikh Abdul Ghaffar Hassan Rahmani. Sheikh Suhaib Hassan, he benefited from Hafiz Muhammad Gondilvi, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz, Sheikh Nasruddin Albani, and all the great scholars who were teaching at the time, Sheikh Muhammad Amin and Sheikh Haiti, and all the great scholars. And today, mashallah, because his father was teacher in Medina, Sheikh Taqiyuddin Hilali came to teach after in Medina University. And Sheikh Taqiyuddin Hilali is linked as well with the great institution in India, Nadwa. So this is why we've wanted to, uh, there's many talks, biographies of Sheikh Albani, Sheikh Ibn Saim, I mean Ibn Baz, of many Saudi scholars, and there's, uh, we felt it was, it would be a good uh, inspiration for our youth to know that the great scholars, not only they're in Syria, they have been in Morocco, uh, Sheikh Zayed Fatah has on in January talk on Sheikh Abdul Hamid Ibn Badis. So Sheikh Taqidin Hilali, lots of people benefit from his um, Nobel Quran, but people don't know the detail of this great um, scholar. So Sheikh Suhaib Hassan met him many times and benefited from him. So that's why we found it was a good opportunity from uh, Sheikh Suhaib Hassan. So without any further ado, I will uh, uh, mute myself and, and uh, let Sheikh Suhaib Hassan, mashallah, to enlighten us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين. my dear brothers sisters who are listening to this talk, I am very thankful to brother Ali to ask me to speak about such a great scholar, a Sheikh Muhammad Taqiyuddin bin Abdul Qadir Al Hilali. Whom I knew personally, but I want to introduce him to you as a great da'iya, a great person who was engaged in da'wah, in da'wah as Salafiyya throughout his life. I want to introduce him like a great scholar of Arabic language and a person with a lot of poetry, and that is. Uh, with eloquence and some of his poetry got so difficult uh, words as well that you need a dictionary to uh, to understand them. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad Taqiyuddin bin Abdul Qadir al Hilali, who was born in 1893, 1893, that is the same year, 1311, about which uh, our uh, other brother Muhammad Ziyad Tukla was speaking when he mentioned about Sheikh Bajat al Bitar because he was born in 1311. So he was born in Damascus, which is the eastern part of uh, Islamic world at that time. And Sheikh Taqiyuddin Hilali was born in the western part of uh, Arabic uh, or Islamic world, that is the country known as Al Maghrib. Al Maghrib, now it is also known as Morocco. And uh, and he was born in a small town, small village called Farah, uh, which is very near to Saldamasa in uh, the south of uh, Al Maghrib. There is one such striking thing I have noticed when I was reading about him that uh, this there is a similarity between uh, him and my father, Sheikh Abu Afar Hassan. Sheikh Sakhiuddin was born in 1893. Exactly 20 years later, my father was born in 1913 in India. 
Sheikh uh, Taqib bin Radi died in 1987, aged 94 years, and according to Hijra, 96 years. And my father died 20 years, exactly 20 years after him in 2007, aged 94 years, and according to Hijra, 96 years. So in age, they were uh, similar to each other. And uh, then there is another similarity that uh, uh, both got connections with India. And then in the, in the end, they were teacher in the great uh, seat of knowledge, Islamic University of Al Madina. Now in this talk, I wanted to speak about, uh, you can say nine different aspects uh, so these uh, different, you can say the title, number one is introduction, second his journeys, because he journeyed a lot, he traveled a lot. So I just want to give, give you a very short briefing about his journeys as well. Third, the main topic is the third and fourth, which is a dawah il Allah, his aspects of dawah il Allah, wherever he went, wherever he goes, he is busy with dawah il Allah on the basis of Al-Quran was Sunnah. The fourth aspect is his debates, his munawarat. And the fifth, his uh, propagation and publications of the books of Salaf. Uh, sixth, his feeling of self-sufficiency, al-istighna and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number seven is uh, his efforts against uh, uh, colonial powers in his days. And number eight, few of his errors, very seldom a person is going to admit his own errors, but he admitted his errors. And this I found it in his book. And that is the main source of my talk as well. His book, which he has written, Adawa Ilallah Fi Aqtarin Mukhtalifa. That is his book, which he compiled when he was a teacher in Al Madina. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, uh, Alhamdulillah, mashallah, is very fruitful and comprehensive book about his dawa and uh, the last point is about his death, his children, his wives and uh, his legacy, his books, his articles. And I don't think I could cover all these points, but so I should be very concise and very brief in some of these uh, issues and some other I can be speaking in detail. The one thing is very interesting to note that in the beginning of his life, when he was brought up and educated in Al Maghrib, he was a Tijani, he was a Sufi, he was uh, following the Tijaniya. That was uh, his tariqa. And uh, uh, he traveled, uh, he, first, uh, uh, he first took knowledge in his own uh, town. He memorized Quran when he was just 12 years old. And uh, he mentions about his journey to Algeria and where uh, he got this uh, reign of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a dream in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying to him, Iqra al -ilm. Iqra al -ilm. read or acquire the knowledge. So he acquired that knowledge from his teacher, Muhammad Sayyidi bin Habibullah of al Shanqit, al Shanqiti and also another Sheikh said Ahmad Sikraj and uh, then he also joined uh, the Qarawiyin University in Fas which is in, our, in English is known as Fas and then he says that after a debate when, uh, with one of his great Sheikh Muhammad bin al-Arabi Muhammad bin al-Arabi al-Alawi after a debate with him he has changed the course of his life I love to find out uh, that book which he wrote, then refuting, refuting At-Tijaniya, uh, Al-Hadiya, uh, Al-Hadiya, Le Firqat At-Tijaniya. I did not come across uh, that booklet in which he has given the whole story, how he changed from Tijaniya to the way of uh, uh, Salaf. And uh, because he has traveled a lot, and I'm going to, uh, to give you uh, th this is the second point uh, that is about his journeys. After the journeys, I will come back to the dawah il Allah. So, uh, around 20 21 years, he was in Al Maghrib acquiring the knowledge there. So, it means that 
till that age, he got uh, all the knowledges, Arabic language, Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, the famous book in uh, Malikiya, Al-Mazhab, Mukhtasar Al-Khalil. He, uh, he took the knowledge of this book and the other books. So he was well equipped with the knowledge when he started his journeys in 1922. And let me, uh, instead of uh, mentioning the years, I may mention his age. And he was 29 years old. He was 29 years old when he first uh, journeyed to Egypt. And uh, then he stayed there doing some dawa. And I'm going to speak about such aspects of his dawa when he was in, in Egypt. And uh, after staying there for a few months, it was Hajj time in 1923 when he went to Makkah for Hajj. And it was uh, still the time of Al-Ashraf. And uh, they say that uh, Imam Hussein ibn Ali, that the, the grand grandfather of uh, the Jordanian king now, he was the ruler at that time. And uh, when he did his Hajj, he was not able to go to Al Madina because going to Al Madina means subjecting yourself to a lot of dangers throughout your journey. So he said to uh, some of his pupils uh, that uh, going to Madina is not the part of Al Hajj and the way is not safe for you to travel because the Bedouins, all that way, they used to loot, they used to. Uh, take uh, every penny from the travelers. Sometimes they kill them as well. So this is why he did not visit at that time in Medina. And after Hajj, he went to, by sea, he went to India. And uh, in India, that was his first visit. In first visit, he visited all the great, you can say all the great uh, teachers, all the great teachers who were known at that time in, 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 in India, like, uh, Abdurrahman uh, Al Mubarak Puri, Abdurrahman ibn Abdurrahim Al Mubarak Puri, who is the uh, writer of Tuhfatul Ahpazi, which is an explanation of Sunan at Tirmizi. Uh, so he met him and he took knowledge from him as well. And uh, the great scholar of Arabic, Abdul Majid al Hariri, and also Khalil Arab. Khalil Arab is the one who later said to Dr. Abdul Ali, the elder brother of Morana Abul Hassan and Nadavi, to take him to a Nadwa, to, be, to take him as a teacher. But that is going to come later. So this time he just uh, uh, met uh, these scholars. And uh, among the other scholars, of course, uh, there were uh, many others like uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Hassan bin Mohsin al Hadidi al Ansari, Hussein ibn Mohsin, Hussein bin Mohsin al Hadidi al Ansari al Yemeni. He was in India at that time and he took ijazah from him. And Sheikh Hussein ibn Mohsin al Hadidi al Ansari al Yemeni, he gave ijazah to Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim, who is uh, uh, later became Mufti of Al Mamlaka, right from the beginning, of course, he was the Mufti of Al Mamlaka. He also visited uh, a great scholar, Hamiduddin Farahi in his hometown. And then he went to Calcutta where he met Abul Kalam Azad and he met his secretary Abdul Razak Mali Abadi because Abdul Razak Mali Abadi used to write uh, uh, many articles for uh, uh, by uh, after dictation from Moran Abul Kalam Azad. But he was of just like a free thinker. This is why Sheikh uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Taqiyuddin Hilali remarked about him that he is a Zindiq, he was a Zindiq, and he is not a, he is not a Muslim. And he also visited the son of great scholar Shamsul Haq Azim Abadi, the son Idris, and uh, he knew about his maktaba. And there is a, web, a very famous uh, library in Patna, which is known as the library of Khuda Bakhsh. He visited that library, and in Lucknow, he visited the library of Sheikh Abdul Hayy al Lucknavi. And uh, uh, on uh, his way back, when he was going to uh, to Bombay to to go back to to Iraq and to some other countries, he was a guest of uh, Sheikh Abdul Samad Sharafuddin, the famous publisher who has published so many books of Sunnah. He stayed there, and uh, there he came across uh, a, a young man who is coming from. Iraq, whose name is whose name is Mustafa Ali Ibrahim, 
and uh, that person of course he was a rich person and uh, he got introduced to him and uh, by that introduction he was able to travel with him without paying any fare because he was going to Basra so he took him uh, with him so I was talking about his journey to India and after that uh, with Mustafa Al Ibrahim it was an interesting story that uh, when he met Mustafa Ibrahim Mustafa Ibrahim came to Sheikh Abdul Samad and he was asking about uh, different uh, uh, grammatical matters so he said what is the Arab of Hamalat al Hatab Bumratuhu Hamalat al Hatab in Surah Lahab there is a fatha on Hamala, Hamala Tal Hatab. So Sheikh Abdul Samad said, Why do you ask me? Ask this gentleman. And he pointed to Taqiyuddin al Hilali. He would tell you. So Taqiyuddin al Hilali, who was uh, just uh, sitting in a corner of that room, then when he was invited to talk, so he said, Yes, Hamala Tal Hatab, it got two kira, and both kira is Sab'iya uh, and Hamala Tul Hatab then there is, uh, uh, there is no difficulty to understand. Both are marfu. So you can take it as mubtada khabar, you can take it as sifa as well. But if you take it with fatha upon then there is a, a tense which is here omitted. In Arabic we say mahzuf. So you say a zummu Hamalat al Hatab, that I condemn. I, so this is this word is hidden here. I condemn Hamalat al Hatab, the carrier of the wood. Uh, so, in this way, when he explained uh, uh, this Arab, the man was impressed, and this is how he took him to, to Al Basra. And there is another uh, story as well, which will show that uh, how pious he was. He said that uh, when we are going to board the ship, I would say to the, the English uh, uh, captain or anyone who is uh, on behalf of the captain who was checking the travelers uh, because uh, he knows me and uh, and and he, he was a rich person so this is why uh, you can say that um, he has already bought a good section of the whole ship you can say so he said that uh, uh, one of my one of my laborers one of my servants who was supposed to be on this ship is going by a boat. So he would not be on that ship. So I am going to name, announce his name when he is going to ask, what is your name? You just say Ahmad, which was the name of that servant. Don't, don't tell your name, huh? because as, a, as my servant, you would be accepted without a ticket, without any checking at all. So Sheikh Taqiyuddin Ahilari said that I can't lie. I can't lie. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. So he said, all right, then keep quiet. I will shout that this is my servant Ahmed. So this is how he boarded the ship and he traveled to Al-Basra. So for Al-Basra, he stayed there and he studied uh, with uh, a great Sheikh, Muhammad Al-Amin Al-Shanqiti. That is another Muhammad Al-Amin Al-Shanqiti, not uh, the one who is the author of Allah Al-Bayan, not the one who is my teacher as well in al Madina because he comes uh, late in our discussion. So this Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti, that is another sheikh who was in al-Basra, and he got a madrasa, madrasa al-Najat, al-Ahliya, where he studied with him as well. And uh, then later in 1927, that was the time of uh, King Abdul Aziz. Then King Abdul Aziz has already taken al-Hijaz by that time. So he, he went to, to al-Hijaz, and uh, he went to Al Madina, where he he became uh, became Al Mushrif, a supervisor to the teachers. And uh, there is an interesting story related to, related to that. This I am going to mention later. Then he came to Mecca, where he stayed there in Al Mahad al Saudi, the the Saudi institution. And now he was uh, trying to get a higher degree. So this is why he said, let me go to India once again and uh, try to acquire a MA, for example, or a doctorate. So this is why he wanted to travel to, to India. So in 1929, he went to India, where he was invited by uh, 
Sheikh Suleiman Nadavi to join Nadbat ulama where he stayed there for four years. That was the period when he was teaching in Nadwa. And that is the time when Sheikh Abul Hassan Nadavi and Sheikh Masood and Nadavi and Sheikh Kazim and Nadavi and Sheikh Abul Nais and Nadavi, all of them, they were his students. In the very same period, uh, in 1929, he, he went to Afghanistan as well uh, because he wanted to see the scholars there. That was his ambition to meet the scholars. So he went there and uh, then he came back, came back to Iraq. And uh, later, just for this, uh, his ambitions to get, uh, uh, to get a degree, in 1936, he went to Germany and uh, uh, he joined Bonn University from where he took uh, the doctorate degree in 1940. In 1940 that uh, he took this degree and uh, we, we can, we are going to mention more about it later. And uh, that was the time you can say that the Second World War, Second World War has already begun. So he, he was there as if he was detained there. So from Berlin, he used to, uh, he used to transmit through Berlin radio his speeches in Arabic and mostly it was uh, about uh, uh, the Palestine as well and uh, uh, he was commending Sheikh Muhammad Amin al Husseini, the Mufti of Palestine and uh, of course as long as he was in Germany he was speaking about the other colonial powers at that time including uh, the British Empire and uh, the French uh, the French who were colonizing all the Western Africa at that time. And that was the main reason why he got uh, so much uh, opposition from uh, the colonial powers in Al-Maghrib in his own country when he, get, when he got back because uh, he was speaking <laughs> against them when he was in, in, in Germany. So, he, he stayed there and uh, in 1942, in 1942, in, you can say that during the war itself, he came back to, he came back to Al Maghrib, Morocco, to a city called Tatwan. And uh, there he stayed for uh, quite good five years. And that is the time of his dawah in Al Maghrib, the real uh, dawah which, uh, which uh, he had done at that time. In uh, 1947, and that is a year when Pakistan was established, as you know that. So in 1947, he was uh, called upon to go to Iraq, where he joined uh, uh, the university, started teaching in Baghdad, and stayed there for uh, uh, a good time, around uh, 11 years, because in 1958, when there was a rebellion, or you can say that uh, a coup against uh, the King Faisal by Abdul Karim Qasim and Abdul Salam Arif. At that time, he has to leave Al Iraq and uh, he came back to Morocco once again, where he was given the duty to teach in the University of Rabat, the capital and also its branch in Fas, which is called, which is known as Fas in, in English. There he stayed there teaching and doing Dawa once again. But in 1968, he was invited by a Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz, the, the president of Islamic University at that time to come and teach in Al Madina. So that is uh, the second time he was coming to Al Madina to teach. And there he stayed uh, uh, for six years because he came back in 1974, 1974. So uh, that was the time when, when he was in Al Madina. I have already left Madina at that time because I, I, I joined myself, I joined uh, the University of Al Madina in 1962. This is two years before my father. My father came after me, two years after me, he was appointed as a, as a professor and uh, he and Sheikh Muhammad Gundalvi. So I took uh, uh, lessons from them 
in my last two years of the university from 1964 to 1966. And 67, I left Al-Madina. I went to East Africa uh, for Dawa. So from East Africa, when I used to come and visit my father, because my father was still there, he stayed there in Medina till 1980. So in one of my visits, yes, I met uh, uh, Sheikh Taqiyuddin al-Hilali. And as we know that uh, he has lost his sight uh, long before that time. So I saw him, I saw him in that, uh, in that way when he was not able to see at all, but I met him. So 1974, he went back to, to his country and uh, then till his death in uh, 1987, till 1987, he remained there and he died in Darul Bayda, which is known as uh, Casa Balanca in English at the age of uh, 94, 94 years, as I have mentioned in the beginning. So that was uh, his long, uh, long life with so many traveling, so many travelings. And I wonder how this person was traveling sometime, uh, walking sometime, uh, riding on a donkey and sometime by ship. And uh, yes, there was uh, a few traveling by air as well. So that was about the second point. Now we come to the third point, which is Adawa ilallah. Yani he is a person who is known with Adawa ilallah throughout his, his life. When he went to Egypt, he went to Iskandaria first. Al Iskandaria, because uh, when he journeyed uh, by ship, so the first port of Egypt he is going to hit that is Alexandria, which is in Al Iskandaria. And there was a good uh, population of Moroccan people living there, and they were all Tijani. But uh, they, uh, when they heard about him and they knew that Sheikh Abdul Qadir, Sheikh uh, Muhammad uh, Taqiuddin Abdul Qadir Hilali, because his uh, and his uh, lineage goes back to Al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he, he is from Sadat. He is from uh, the family of Sayyidina Ali. So this is why he was held in a great esteem, with a great respect by all the people. So they gave respect to Sheikh Taqiyuddin al Hilali there. And uh, they Sheikh Taqiyuddin Ali in the beginning, he did not disclose that he is no more Tijani, but he was just uh, uh, lecturing to them from time to time. But they discovered that Sheikh Taqiyuddin Ali goes to a mosque which is known to be the mosque of Wahhabi. Wahhabi people are al these people, are Salafi people. When they knew that, they said, what is happening to him? So I let him ask some questions. So they started questioning him uh, in a different ways to find out what is his real mazhab. And of course, he could not uh, hide from them what uh, he believed. So when they knew, they wrote to one of their sheikh, whose name is Muhammad ibn Mubarak al-Susi. They asked him, what is your opinion about Taqiyuddin al-Hilali? And he wrote to them, yes, he is, because he is from Sadat and he was a uh, very much respected fellow. So give him proper respect, but don't take knowledge from him. That was his answer. So this is why he was uh, deserted by his own people. And uh, uh, so he has to find out uh, some other avenues or some other places to do his dawah. So in the, uh, you can say in the south of Egypt, which is, uh, uh, which is Asyut, so he went to Asyut. And he started his dawah there. The people in Asyut, the Salafi people in Asyut, uh, they were very happy to, to welcome him. And uh, he said that they took him to a small village called uh, Rairamun. And that was the journey on the back of a donkey. So where with his dawah, all the people, they were all um, very much engrossed deep into Tariqah, into Sufiya, into Bid'ah. A lot of Bid'ah were there. But uh, with his speeches in the mosque, people started uh, coming to him, listening to him. And 
uh, they used to used to leave their practices and uh, they started uh, entering into the madhab of uh, kitab and sunnah so it brought a great change they said uh, man you have to stay with us we are not going to allow you to leave us you can marry here but don't please don't leave us anyhow he stayed there for uh, for a few months and uh, but he has changed the whole area with his dawa to such an extent that one of their imam is a sufi imam came to visit them and he found that faces are different faces they are not uh, welcoming him as they used to welcome him they are not giving him money as they used to give him long ago so he was surprised and they knew what is the reason so how to get them back what he did uh, the place from where he used to give uh, his speeches he brought a wooden box a big wooden box and on the box on the on the box itself he got a carpet where he used to sit and address his people and then he advertised among the people that he is not happy with them and he is going to leave so people of course they were very worried that our sheikh our sheikh is going to leave us so uh, what he did that when there was no one in the room he opened the lid of that box and he has hidden himself in the box itself now the students came to see him and they did not find the sheikh there in the in the room and uh, the rumor was everywhere that the sheikh has left he was angry with us so everybody is looking for him in all the corners of the village in all the ways leaving the village they did not find him after that they came back once again to his room and they found him sitting there oh you are here where you were oh he said because there was a jihad going on in libya uh, between the muslims and the italians i just went there i was there to support them and i am just coming back from from libya you see this is how he made them fool and when they heard that our sheikh is uh, of such a great esteem and he was traveling to libya for that purpose all flocked back to him and kissing his hands and kissing his head and offering him money so you can in, uh, understand that what type of people uh, they were uh, there i may be mentioning uh, uh, incidents from here and there uh, without uh, any proper historical order when he was in tatwan later after as i said when he came back to tatwan uh, from germany and he started his dawa so he revived many sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as you know that uh, mazhab according to malikia when they pray they don't uh, uh, they, they don't place their hand uh, the right hand on the left hand like this on on the chest in the prayer they just uh, make it loose they just don't fold it so they don't fold it on their chest so he started the sunnah that is the folding the hand on your chest in the prayer and doing rafa al yadain raful yadain when you go to ruku raise your hands and when you go to ruku and then raise your hand when you come back from the ruku and in the same way reading bismillah before al fatiha so he revived all these sunnah and people followed it and uh, he said but some people were so so much uh, prejudiced prejudiced in their mazhab they used to say nahnu khalilun nahnu khalilun means they we follow the book al khalil mukhtasar al khalil which is in uh, maliki fiqh we are the follower of that book and we are with khalil if he goes to al jannah we will go to al jannah if he goes to the hellfire we will go to the hellfire and this is why he said to them oh you are saying such thing uffil lakum wa lima ta'buduna min dunillah the saying of sayyidna ibrahim alayhi salam to his people and these people were so much enemy to him that they wanted to kill him uh, a number of time about 25 people they plotted against him and even they collected an amount of blood money that when he is killed 
and his people are going to ask for the blood money, we can offer them that blood money. So they have gone to that extent to collect the blood money and kill him. But uh, when they consulted their uh, leader, uh, who's called Amir Khalid al-Raisuni, so he said, no, that is, uh, that is not right, don't do it. So this is why they could not uh, uh, materialize uh, this conspiracy. And later he says that one of them, who was the brother of Khalid al-Raisuni, his name is Ahmad al-Raisuni, he is the one who gave him uh, his place to stay because uh, Sheikh Taqib bin Hali at that time, he was suffering from asthma. And uh, the climate near the sea was not suitable for him. So he wanted to go up to the mountains. So there are mountains called Shafshaun. So he went to Shafshaun where Ahmad al-Rasuni hosted him and then he told him about this conspiracy as well. And uh, Sheikh Taqib bin Hirali also mentions that uh, how the people were so, yani, so engrossed in their bid'ah that there is an old person. He is a murid of a young man who claimed that I am the Qutb. I am the Qutb because uh, they say that in uh, there, there are uh, Qutb who are running this universe and he is one of the Qutb. And even he, he offered him his daughter to marry. So that was the person. And uh, then the, this old man said to this young man who is the Qutub that uh, we want to go for Hajj. And because we know that uh, a wali, a sheikh like you, he will take only one step uh, to Mecca. Huh? Just in one step, he would be in Mecca. So when you go to Mecca, then take take us with you as well and take uh, my wife as well, your wife as well. He said, no, yes, we are going to do that. Now the hush time has come. It was the day of Arafah. People are now assembling in Arafah for Hajj. So the man came to him, Ya Sheikh, Ya Sheikh, when we are going to Mecca and when we are going to, to stand in Arafat. He said, no, no, come, come with me. And uh, then they went to the roof of the house where there was, uh, you can say, a small, uh, uh, a small room type building yeah, around which they can do some circling. So he said, this is, here you have to do some circles, which is tawaf. So do tawaf here around this building. And then he said, uh, you are in Arafat now. And so do your dua and uh, your hajj is acceptable. At that time, the man realized that he has been fooled by his sheikh, by his qutub. So he started beating him. And he said uh, that divorce my daughter because his daughter was wed to him. And then they threw him out of the town. And he also says about this sheikh that how he used to give fatwa contradictory fatwa. Any person there, for example, two persons came to him in a dispute, in a financial dispute. One was a Muslim trader and the other was a Jewish trader. So when the Muslim one came, he gave a fatwa in his favor. And uh, when the Jewish came, he gave his fatwa in his favor as well. And both fatwa at that time, because the area was still occupied uh, at, in those days, uh, Morocco or Al Maghrib was occupied by uh, a greater part by French and a smaller part by Spanish. And there was an influence of Germany as well in some parts of, uh, of the area. So uh, the matter came to the Spanish uh, resident at that time. A resident is the person who was looking after that area. And when he saw two contradictory fatwas, he became so angry. How are your shiuch? They are uh, making a, a mockery of your sharia. We, we, we don't believe in such type of sharia. So in this way, in this way, how he discovered that this sheikh was spoiling, uh, this, uh, was spoiling the situation. And then uh, the person of this sheikh was, of course, he was, uh, uh, he was uh, asked to leave the place. 
He also mentioned Sheikh Taqib bin Hilali that these people, uh, when there was a time and there was no rain, so instead of praying Salatul Istisqa, they used to go to the graves of their mashayikh and offer in sacrifice a bull. And another bull, another uh, grave of, uh, at the grave of another sheikh. And if it was a smaller sheikh, then they are going to sacrifice a goat only or a sheep only. Another of their bid'ah was sometime how they are going to, uh, to get, get the rain, they will take a horse and on uh, the forehead of the horse, they are going to write this ayah of Surah to Surah. وَهُوَ الَّذِي يُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْسَ بَعْدَ مَا قَنِتُ وَيَنْشُرُ رَحْمَتَهُ وَهُوَ الْوَلِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ He is the person who, he is Allah who brings down the rain. And uh, he is the one who spreads his rahma. وَهُوَ الْوَلِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ وَهُوَ الَّذِي يُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْسَ بَعْدَ مَا قَنَتُ وَيَنْشُرُ رَحْمَتَهُ وَهُوَ الْوَلِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ so instead of praying, they used to do this action. And there was another way of uh, asking for rain. They will take 70,000 pebbles, which were given to 70 people. Each person got a bag of 1,000 pebbles. And the same ayah is going to be read upon each verse. And after that, all these uh, bags are going to be thrown into the river when they reach the level of depth of the river they are tied with a rope so the one side of the rope is tied with the bags and the other side to a tree on the bank of the river and they say that as long as uh, this rope is not cut the rain uh, will uh, start coming anyhow Sheikh Taqid bin Hilali went to the desert and then he prayed with uh, all the people uh, around and alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought uh, the rain for them. Uh, in the same way he mentioned about Iraq and uh, the bid'ah there and he himself he did not he did not pray in a mosque where there was a grave because normally in Iraq all the mosques there must have a grave there in even in the mosque which is named after Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi except for one masjid this is called Masjid al-Dahan where there was no grave and the mutawalli of that masjid the caretaker or mutawalli of that masjid, asked Shaykh Taqir bin Hilali to be al-Khatib there so he uh, he started khutbah there and uh, he told the people that there is no sunnah before Juma prayer the sunnah is after Juma prayer so he revived that sunnah as well he revived the Sunnah in Azan as well. And uh, those people who, who made that coup in 1958, one of them was Abdul Salam Arif. He was among his, his pupils and he was a Salafi at that time. But Abdul Karim Qasim, later, he threw him out, but put him into the prison. And later, Abdul Salam Arif was able to, uh, to come out of the prison and then he became the president. And at that time, he asked Taqiyuddin Hilali to come back once again to Iraq. But anyhow, Taqiyuddin Hilali did not, uh, did not accept. Uh, there are many things, but now I have to be very, very brief. Uh, because I can see in the time as well. His debates, number uh, fourth point is the, uh, his debates. And he says about the debates are munazara. Don't do munazara. Except if you are forced to do it, then you can enter into munazara. He himself, he did so many munazarat, uh, so many munazarat uh, with so many people. Uh, he mentioned uh, one Ahmad al-Siddiq who uh, did debate. And that debate was in writing about a hadith in al-Nasai. Imam al-Qayyim has mentioned him in his book at turuq al hikmiyah about uh, that uh, woman, somebody, somebody raped her. To, uh, did not uh, you know, raped her and ran away. So she shouted for help. A second person came and he wanted to chase the other person. And by this shouting, more people came. And instead of uh, the real person, 
who was the culprit, they, they brought uh, the second person who was chasing after him. And uh, this is how the, the, the woman did not recognize that who was the real person. So they, there is this hadith that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu wanted to make had to make had upon the second person who was not the real culprit. But at that time, the, the real person came and then he admitted. About this hadith, there was a debate uh, and uh, Sheikh wanted to uh, prove that uh, uh, this hadith is not authentic. Another debate which is uh, with another Sheikh is called Habibullah Maya Ashanqiti. Ashanqiti. That person, he used to say that Salafi people are of three types. He was in Al Hijaz in uh, Makkah at that time. He said the Salafi of Najd, they say that they are all kuffar. Why? Because they believe that Allah SWT is in the heaven. The Salafi of Egypt and Syria, he said that they are Wullal. They have gone astray because they don't follow Taqlid. And the Salafi of India, he says that they are in error. Mukhti'un, they are in error. Why did they say that they are not the real kuffar? Uh, why? Because they say that at least they come to Masjid al Nabawi and they visit uh, the grave of the Prophet. But the reason was that he was financed, this sheikh was financed by a great Indian scholar, Indian trader, Abdul Wahab al Dehlavi. Abdul Wahab al Dehlavi. So that was the reason. And uh, at that time, during that time when he was there, uh, deputations came from Indonesia or some pilgrims came from Indonesia and they were Salafi. And because they wanted to speak about Tawheed and about uh, Quran and Sunnah, uh, so these people, these people, you know, they, that was the time when Makkah al Madina al Hijaz was still in the hand of Al Ashraf. So these Indonesians, uh, they were imprisoned. And even Sheikh Taqiyuddin Hilali has to, has to remain uh, in hiding for seven days, for seven days uh, because of uh, this fitna. Now, uh, another thing which he, he mentioned uh, about uh, when during the time of uh, the King Abdul Aziz, when everything was settled. So this is the second time when he came to Al Hijaz and Sheikh Abdullah bin al Hassan al Shaykh, he offered him to be Imam in Al Madina. Taqiyuddin Hilali said, with one condition, I accept. And this condition is that in Ruku and Sujood, I have to say Tasbihat 10 times. 10 times, SubhanAllah. Uh, he said, that will be a very long time. People are not going to tolerate it. So he said, then I can't accept it. So this is how he was given the other job to be the supervisor of the teachers in, in the mosque. And then he got his munazarat when he was in Basra with the uh, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al-Kazimi, who was a Shia, about the Hadith Anna Madinatul Ilm wa Aliyun Babuha. And uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin uh, uh, Bulhaid, uh, that uh, Sheikh only became angry with him because he used, Sheikh Taqidun Hilali said that uh, the earth is round, huh? his Qura is round. And he said, no, it is flat. So because of that, he became very angry with him. And later, uh, this developed into his expulsion or uh, his, uh, his job to be, to be stopped and to be terminated. And then he went back to Makkah and after Makkah, he came back to, as we earlier said, he went to, other places. Uh, the, uh, the other point is uh, he publicized so many books of, uh, of Salaf and in them is uh, the book Kashf al-Shubuhat because Kashf al-Shubuhat is the book of Sheikh Muhammad Madhul Wahhab. So he introduced it in Al-Maghrib by leaving the name of Abdul Wahhab. So he said Muhammad ibn Sulaiman al-Dar'i, his grandfather Muhammad ibn Sulaiman. So this is why uh, it uh, 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 it was known to the people and people accepted it. In the same way, he publicized uh, the, uh, the booklet of Sheikh Al-Imam Nathami, Ziyarat al-Qubur, by his name, omitting 
Ibn Tamiya. He said, Ahmad Ibn Abdul Halim Al-Harrani. And uh, when he received a lot of copies of Fatul Majid, he did not distribute them free. He said uh, that if a book is free, people are not going to read it. And he mentioned the saying of Bernard Shah that if you find a book free, if you get a book free, that book is not going to be read. So he used to charge them a slight, a little charge of that. And uh, he also, uh, Sheikh Taqibuddin Hilali, when he was in Maghrib, he contributed in uh, publicizing Lisanuddin, a magazine, then uh, Dawatul Haq, another magazine. And then he used to write uh, for uh, the, the magazine of al uh, at the invitation of Sheikh Hassan al-Banna, the founder of al -Ikhwan. He used to write in <coughs> Dididatul Fath of Muhibuddin al-Khatib. And when he was in Nadwa, uh, in uh, <coughs> Lucknow, he started a Bia, very famous uh, magazine of Nadwatul Ulama. So, and of course, uh, in the end of his life, when he was in Medina, he translated the meaning of Al Quran, uh, which is known as the Noble Al Quran, and he also translated Al Lulu Al Marjan in English. And he himself, he uh, he was he mastered seven languages, seven languages. He was a great scholar <laughs> in all. Uh, aspects of life. Uh, the point number six, uh, that he was uh, very much mustagni, self-sufficient. He does not want to take money from the people, just like uh, as our brother was saying about Bajat al-Bitar, and there are so many stories how he rejected the money. He did not want to take money. And uh, even when he went to Afghanistan and he was given some money to go back to India, because that was their practice. Whenever a visitor comes, they did not give him money. They give him uh, they give him lodging in the hotel and he, he is provided with food, but no money. So, but he, but at the time when he's retreating, they will give him money enough to go back to his country. But he did not accept that money when he was given, when he said that I'm going back to India. Why? Because he knew there are some visitors from Arabs at that time. And they became so angry, so angry. They started shouting at Afghan people that you people are uh, miser people. You don't give us money. <laughs> so that was a bad reputation. This is why he did not accept money from them. And uh, uh, about, uh, I'm just making very brief now, uh, about his efforts uh, against colonial powers. Uh, and I said to you that when he was in Germany, he was transmitting his speeches uh, at that time in, 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 in favor of uh, uh, Germany at that time. So this is why the French and English, they were all dead against him. He said about uh, French something very interesting. He said, uh, I am an enemy. I'm, I will remain enemy to France as long as I live. When amut fa'usi ahibba'i yu'aduna habadi. And when I die, I say to all those who love me that you remain enemy to him. Now, uh, about uh, those things uh, which he accepted as his errors. For example, when he was Tatuan, he was shaving his beard. People said to him that you are saying Quran, Sunnah, Quran, Sunnah, but you shave your beard. So he said to them that when I was in Germany, I started shaving. And he believed that it is a minor sin. It is not a major sin. So he, he admitted his error and then he, of course, he started uh, uh, growing uh, his beard as well. Uh, and in Afghanistan, when he caught with malaria, very, very strong uh, malaria and uh, nothing benefited him. He said that I heard uh, some people, they are doing one ruqya that they used to write on three papers, the name of Fir'aun and Haman and Karun and then they burn it. Yes. So he did that, he did that, and he said that I benefited a little about this after this Rukia. But it was actually, he himself says that it was actually because when the, when the, the papers were burned and uh, the smoke started rising with some heat into it, that is what uh, benefited him. Uh, so anyhow, he admitted that uh, what he done, it was, it was wrong and uh, uh, um, another thing which he did that 
when he was going to Afghanistan, he should have, uh, he must have the name of Afghanistan among the countries he's allowed to visit in his passport. And Afghanistan was not there. And he has to, he was now in, uh, in Lahore, but he came to Peshawar. So from Peshawar, he has to go back to Bombay to consulate, French consulate, <coughs> to get his passport done. His passport was French at that time. <coughs> so, so that he, he did, that he fabricated. He fabricated in his passport and by erasing, uh, there was a word very similar to Afghanistan. He erased it and put Afghanistan there and uh, nobody detected it. So this is how he was able to get into Afghanistan. Now I'm looking at the time. Let me come to his death, sir, which was on 22nd of June, 1987, which is 25th of Shawwal, 1407. Before his death, he was uh, on his bed and he used to do uh, tayammum all the time. Tayammum with actual clay, not upon stone. And one day he said, no, bring me wudu, bring me water. So he did his wudu, he prayed to Rakha prayer, and then he asked someone to read uh, Surah Yasin. In the end of Surah Yasin, when he reached to this verse, When he read this ayah, who is going to give life to the bones when they are rotten completely? He said himself, the following ayah, Say, those, the one who created it first is going to enlive them, give them another life. And at that time, he raised his index finger and he passed away. That was how he died. And uh, very briefly, if we can uh, make it in one minute as well, that throughout his life, he married five women, uh, one Algerian, two Saudis, one Iraqi, one from German, and from, uh, one from Morocco. It comes to six, but we have to verify this number. And from them, he got four daughters and two sons. Uh, as far as books, he wrote about 43 books, and there are uh, three books in which uh, he got uh, his Hawashi, his footnotes, and five books of uh, poetry, and uh, six translations, including the translation of the Quran. And uh, uh, according to some researchers, about 900 articles he wrote. 900 articles he wrote. And uh, he met uh, so many shiuch and so many dignitaries. Uh, in his life, like uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman Warakuri, and uh, uh, I have mentioned few names before. Some more um, names are like Shakib Ar Salam. This is why he named his son Shakib because he loved Shakib Ar Salam, Rashid Rewa, Muhibuddin Khatib, Muhammad bin Ramin Al Shamkiti, Muhammad bin Ibrahim, Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Abdul Bahir Abu Samh in Egypt, Muhammad Ramli in Egypt, and uh, and then he got uh, Sheikh. Uh, Ibn Baz, Sheikh Abdul Rauf al Sabban in Mecca, Hamiduddin Farahi, Abu Kalam Azad. This I have already mentioned Hamid al Fiqi, Muhammad Nasif, Muhammad bin Abdul Karim al Khattabi, a great warrior from Morocco, Mufti Amin al Husseini, Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Razak al Hamza, Abdul Aziz al Khawli, his uh, brother Muhammad al Arabi al Hilali. He used to be in one, some of his journeys, uh, so he was a, a great helper to him. And among his students are, I mentioned Maulana Abul Hassan Nadavi, Masood Al Nadavi, Saeed Al Azami, Abu Lais Al Nadavi, Kazim Al Nadavi, Hamad, Sheikh Hamad, Sheikh Hamad Al Ansari. Uh, but uh, uh, his uh, Hamad Al Ansari and also Sheikh Abdul Mu'sin Hamad Al Abad has said about him that Sheikh Taqiyuddin, his students have uh, wasted him, means did not benefit from his knowledge. Both of them, they have remarked this. Sheikh Umar bin Hassan al Shaykh, Sheikh Muhammad bin Nasir al Abudi, the great traveler uh, who wrote so many books of his traveling, and uh, Sheikh Abdul Wadid, Badud bin Abdul Abdul Tawab, Multani, uh, when he first went to India and he taught in uh, Madrasa Ali Jan in Delhi, that was one of his students. So, this is how there is a great uh, list of his students and his teachers. 
and uh, the, this uh, my this speech still got uh, so many uh, you know, so many points to be to be discussed later and it needs a, a more, more research i am very interested to know uh, what type of speeches he was doing when he was in germany from berlin uh, radio this is still to be covered by me inshallah in further research alhamdulillah we are about to uh, about uh, we have already finished the time so i take uh, your leave now jazakumullah khairan thank you very much sallallahu ta'ala ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakumullah Jazakallah, Sheikh. It was a very, mashallah, beneficial talk, mashallah. Very enlightening as usual, mashallah. Very detailed, especially about the great scholars of India, Saudi Arabia, from which Sheikh Suhabasan as well benefited from many of them. So, mashallah.